Office of the Medical Examiner, Beatsville. Dr. Jack Hanman is speaking. How can I help you? Good evening, this is Kate Brooks. I'm not sure if you remember me. A few weeks ago, we talked about an article I'm working on. It's about your wife. I dropped by last Friday to speak to you, but you weren't working at the time. <laughs> I asked the security guard to pass on a note for me. I would like us to discuss the topic of... I thought I had made it painfully obvious for the last time. No! Please don't call me again and stop inquiring about my wife. Damn journalists. <sighs> they don't let me work. God damn it. I'm not in the best frame of mind to record a lecture for my students now. I'm feeling completely broken. <sighs> Where did I leave my meds this time? Okay, time to pull myself together. And get back to work. I've already taken my pills, I'm not looking to overdose. Oh, I need to set up the camera first. This place is starting to look like a hoarder's dream, rather than a storage room. I don't see any need to mess with the electrics. They are flaky enough as it is. <sighs> now remember, Jack. Don't forget to hit the record button this time. But the word is, the lab will be open tomorrow. Hopefully the new tripod is going to hold up. Now, I just have to get everything in frame. This should be fine. November 20th, 1991. Time. 8.43 p.m. Recording for medical students from the University of Missouri. This autopsy is conducted by Jack Handman. Hello, everyone. Let's start. Always wear an apron, mask, and gloves. Goggles are a must when the job is splashy. And in case of sharp accidents, it's worth having disinfectants at hand. It's true that you won't get ptomaine poisoning straight away, but if your liver or kidney aren't doing well, you may end up with diarrhea. The cadaver is placed on its back on the autopsy table. The pathologist stands on the right of the deceased. Make sure that all the necessary tools are always at hand so that you don't have to run around looking for something like I do all the time. In the process of revealing and securing forensic evidence, it is difficult not to interfere with the original condition of the deceased. Written and photographic documentation plays a vital role throughout the entire examination process. During your research, be patient, inquisitive, but above all, attentive to detail. Many entries are visible at first glance, but sometimes they can be cover for more interesting stories. And lastly, remember that nothing teaches you self-narration like working with the dead. So get used to that fact soon. Everyone will think you're talking to yourself. Now, on to the police folder. That will contain all sorts of pertinent information as to who the deceased might be and what potentially happened to them. So. Let's take a closer look, shall we? The deceased's name is Tobias Chambers, locally known as Old Toby. Homeless and unemployed for at least a couple of years. The deceased was found on the outskirts of a parking lot at a gas station. 
where he often begged and persistently offered drivers to wash their car windows. The body was noticed by a station employee during the morning shift. Initially, he thought that someone had thrown some boots and a coat in a nearby ditch. It took him a moment to recognize the pile of clothes as the body of a man. He worked most of his life at the local port dealing with unloaded cargo. He was fired for being drunk and starting fights. His son runs a hardware store on his own. His wife left him years ago. They both had no contact with the deceased. Signs of libation were found around the body. Empty bottles, traces of an inept attempt to start a fire, and a scattered makeshift blanket. That's it. It's worth remembering the context around the scene of a death. This allows you to better interpret any traces found on the body. I shouldn't start the procedure without gloves. It's been a while since the eyewash in this thing was changed. It's br Now it's our turn to take some pictures for our files. If I can just remember where I left the camera... Um... It's in here somewhere. Aha! <laughs> there you are. I knew it was here somewhere. As I mentioned at the beginning, before we begin the internal examination, we need to document the cadaver in the condition it arrived in. We begin with a full body photo. Try and stick to the top-down rule, but this is not always possible. Let's keep in mind it's all about the legibility, not the perfect frame. Voila! Now we move on to the next step, looking for traces. Take your time. Look at the corpse from different sides, from different angles, up close, and from a distance. You're looking for anything out of the ordinary. The boiler yield wound. Looks old. I'll take a closer look later. Some wounds in the feet and signs of frostbite. Probably because the subject's shoes were too small. Hardened hands, worn out by physical work, and frostbite. That's something interesting. It will be necessary to check whether this injury was severe enough to cause damage to the brain. In a moment, we will check which of our initial observations will be worthy of further consideration. But before we get to that, I need to write down some basic data. Personal information. Uh, the deceased was unclothed. Date. Okay. As you can see, I note everything down on previously prepared forms. Every pathologist must keep a detailed record of every step of the autopsy. This not only allows you to track the procedure, but also collates the results together, upon which you may back up your conclusions. So, enough of the boring prep. Let's begin by taking a closer look at the spots I photographed earlier. For this, you're going to need a magnifying glass. Which spot first? It looks like a burn mark. No doubt painful, but it's not pertinent for this case. Here we can see frostbite on the fingertips. We can tell by the characteristic skin color. I can confirm the presence of ecchymosis on the deceased man's head. The appearance indicates the intravital nature of the wound. Add alcohol, which I can clearly smell. And this was an accident just waiting to happen. Definitely a painful mix of frostbite, 
abrasions and blisters. Old Toby had been wearing shoes too small for him for a very long time. That's if he wore any at all. So far, there are a lot of superficial wounds, but only one serious injury to the head. Let's go back to our notes. First, I mark the location of the injuries and make even though this type of wound didn't contribute to the deceit, the head wound. Definitely and we're not in frost if Toby's body was cold for a prolonged period. The frostbite could have resulted from the body's defense reaction. The safety of the internal organs is more important than fingers, nose, or ears. As you can see, we don't have much to go on. Let's write down what preliminary causes of death we can think of. Various types of accidents are a common cause of death among the homeless and the elderly. Perhaps old Toby slipped and accidentally hit his head. This is of no interest to us. Considering the conditions in which he slept, his body may have become hypothermic. The nights have been particularly nasty lately. Signs of freezing internally. Since the deceased clearly smelled of alcohol, I'll add alcohol poisoning to our list. We still have one thing left from the basics, rigor mortis. Well, we take our deceased by the hand, gradually we raise it, Now let it go. As you can see, the hand falls loose. What's the conclusion? Death must have occurred more than 72 hours ago. The police information appears correct. Head trauma seems the most promising, so we'll start there. For this, I need an oscillating saw. The cut is made from BRT 